So I'm going to start today by inviting Josh uh, to tell us a story that he shared on Facebook, which got me thinking about how we could uh, have this conversation today. I'll tell you, yeah, I'll tell you about my crybaby moment where I, where I got uh, frustrated and made a post on Facebook, which then drew the attention. Um, yeah, I mean, precursor to this is that there, for some of us, um, this pivot to digital is not super brand new in that like we have been approaching film work or video work in different facets uh, throughout our practice for quite some time. Um, it just so happened that um, this particular occasion, I, I had made something uh, during the onset of the pandemic uh, film work um, out of a uh, desire to keep working with some material that I had been working with. I made a film called Brimming. It was a short film. And just like any of our past films, I wanted to put it out into the world in conversation with other dance films and at other um, places and different audiences could experience it. And um, there, of course, is a large network of dance on screen festivals. And I was um, submitting through what has become quite the most prominent hub for festival submissions, which is Film Freeway. And just recognizing how many dance on screen festivals had in fact popped up um, that were many of which, which were brand new. And I'd also noticed how much the submission fee to submit your film to be considered for the film festival had also kind of skyrocketed. So we're talking about, you know, 50 to $75 to put your film, your short five minute film forward for someone to decide whether or not it's good enough to be part of their festival or part of their curation um, vision. Um, and so I was just kind of getting upset because the, the notion is, is that these festivals are these dance, specifically dance film festivals were um, under the model of the traditional film festival, which is to create visibility around your work and to hopefully have somebody who's maybe in a place to give you more opportunity to uh, show up and see it and then to provide you with that big Hollywood cash that we're all after. Um, but in the case of dance, it, the, the problem I was seeing was that no one was, no one's getting paid. Um, if they are selected, there is no monetary uh, payment. There is in fact um, limitations to what you're allowed to do with the film. If you are selected, you have to remove it from any public visibility. Um, and there was also um, kind of a built in um, handing over of the rights for the film to be um, further shown by them in the future through their archival um, packages of dance films that they would then sell off to uh, other different people who wanted to present these packages of dance films. And so thinking about, you know, the sheer number of dance artists at this moment who want to continue their practice, don't have an outlet in order to do that, therefore have their iPhones or have uh, friends who are filmmakers or have some sort of means to create digital work and explore digital work. Hundreds, if not thousands of dance films have been made over the past year and thinking about um, these few people who are offering an online audience and not paying any money in regards to a venue in order to present these works um, taking the money of all of these artists who wish to have their work seen um, and then to charge money to audiences who wish to see those works. It feels like something's missing in terms of the, the content creation and then the content being shared. Um, where, is, where is the value placed? Who, where, who are we giving value to? And um, what is the, the, the payoff, I suppose? Um, versus me just posting my own work through my own YouTube channel. Right. Uh, that was that was kind of the get-go of the, the the conversation that I wanted to have. Right, and and that really piqued my interest because I think the 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 nub of the issue from a legal point of view for and and certainly in the work that we've we've seen and the questions that we've seen over the last many months have been. Um, both presenters, small presenters, presenters who are not familiar with filmmaking and digital production of imagery, say video, um, except for archival documentation of dance, suddenly being put into a situation where they have to 
uh, understand how the rights might be differently dealt with. Um, and that they were caught sometimes unaware and not maybe, not out of um, anything uh, malign, but simply that they were uh, thinking that, oh, maybe there's a way to monetize the stream for the festival that's mm -hmm. also struggling, right? So you got the dancers struggling, the company struggling, filmmakers also struggling in a particular area that is quite niche, as I'm sure as well were impacted, and presenters, particularly, you know, small presenters and, and, and festivals of, of lovers of dance, you know, it's like going to, as I go to VIDF every year and, and uh, dancing on the edge and all these festivals, this, these are platforms made for, for, uh, possibilities. They're not made for the, the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. And so they're also being caught out on how to manage all those rights issues. And it and that brought up to me also um, stories that Tara Cheyenne and uh, Evan Siebens had shared with me when we did this cop, uh, conversation about copyright a few years ago. Uh, which is um, a conversation is up on SoundCloud and we'll make sure that everybody gets a link to that. And that's where you came in, Allison, into my consciousness as somebody who's made dance films and for whom this is your milieu. So how, how's it going for you and how would you address this? Um, it's interesting because as Josh was saying, I was doing this before there was a pandemic and before performers were just screwed and we can't perform, what are we going to do? So needed to basically become filmmakers really quickly or partner with people to help them become filmmakers. And I think it's, it's a bit shocking and horrifying. I know most dancers are in a model of it's you have to have sponsorship, you have to have patronage to be sustainable. And to find out that, oh, film is even crazier that way. Like when I'm talking film, I'm talking about the kind of films that Tamara and I are making that are basically art films or short films. So they're not a feature film. They're not going to get us work directing features or television or anything that, that, that necessarily pays money. Just about how expensive it is <laughs> when you're going through everything that you need to do. And it's like, they get paid how much? And you need them for what? And what is that? It's a bit mad. Um, so, and it's not, it's not as sponsored or um, as dance is more recognized as, whereas film as an art form isn't necessarily a super recognized or sponsored or it's hard to monetize. I mean, that's changing now a little bit. But um, in the past, it's like, well, an art gallery is not going to buy your film. I mean, maybe they will if you're at a certain level. So yeah, it was wanting to, and then also I'm, I'm feeling like, oh my God, I'm now competing with these people that are desperate to make money. <laughs> like I'm trying to make artworks and it's like, well, these artists need to make, they need to be performing. So yeah, it's been, I kind of want to help and, and not just be the, the bear of bad news in terms of, yeah, this is not a money-making venture and it's gonna cost you a fortune and you're gonna be ripping your hair out and and be sorry you ever did this. <laughs> well, that, that's a very bleak assessment. Um, well, no, but I don't, I think it is just as Josh was saying, when you look at all of the aspects that you're doing, it's not, with a, with a performance, you understand what you have to go through to get to the performance level. And then you've created something that's reproducible on a performance level. With, with the film, it's like doing all of that and then having to capture it and then having to go through a bunch more levels in terms right. of post-production, which are like, what? Yeah. yeah, Yeah, it's just a bigger, it's a bigger thing. Yeah, it's the difference between, you know, the picking this up and making yourself into a filmmaker or whatever I might make myself into. I'd never purport to call myself a filmmaker making a little movie with this. Um, but lots of people are trying to do that, 
right? I mean, and then that's the, and there is the ubiquity now of performed stuff all over the place being record, rec recorded performances. And one of the conversations that uh, we, we've been having um, as part of, and we'll be having with musicians as part of this series in June, is this idea of musicians being presented with where they used to arrive at a performance venue with their instrument and play and then leave. Now they have to uh, get the sound people, do all the work, perform the performance, and then rec record it, make it look visually okay, make sure the sound is good, and then package it and send it to the presenter. And so again, it's a very different relationship, but it, very similar to, I think, what you're describing, Josh and um, Tamir. So tell me, Tamir, what about your work? Uh, my work, I, I'm very much an emerging dancer and video artist, but I did start doing it before the pandemic. And so I feel like I, it felt very natural when everything kind of went down last year to continue doing the work I was doing. But I'm also very lucky and privileged to be the youth curator for the Festival of Recorded Movement Born, which is located here in Vancouver and Company 605 is also a founding producer of the festival. So I feel like I'm I'm on both sides, kind of. I get to be the artist and also a festival organizer. And something I think about often is as a festival organizer is how, who is benefiting the intention versus the impact. And it goes back to, to the payment of artists is if we're asking them to submit films and acknowledging the work that has already been put into creating a film and all of that, and then putting it out there and and trying to give it a life after the fact, the least we can do is, is show them that we're thinking about them by, by paying them for their work. Because I think in the society that we live in, that is the way to support artists is to offer them payment. So I have had conversations with many others about this and it, it kind of feels like chicken and the egg kind of thing is <laughs> what's gonna happen first. Our festival organizer is gonna be like, okay, like we, we can't put on a festival if, if we're not gonna pay artists or are we as artists gonna be like, we're not gonna give you our films <laughs> if you're not, if you're not gonna show us monetary support. Um, and so I don't have an answer. <laughs> I, I think I'm again, been very lucky to be a part of Forum because we, we pay our artists and it's thanks to funding from the Canada Arts Council and BC Arts Council that we can do that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, it's it's something that I think thanks to the pandemic, finally there's like talk about it. And it's not just this like, oh, I'm, I'm trying to be a dance and film artist. And so I guess even if I'm not getting paid, someone is seeing my work and that will be good enough for now. And this is especially for like emerging and youth artists who who feel like maybe they don't have a voice to be like, I, you know, yeah. <laughs> I mean, this whole idea of packaging up a film that you've submitted to a festival into some other, you know, film freeway is gonna package up a bunch, make, make it make a package and sell that on, and that you would lose control over the work at that level, that's highly problematic to me. Like. Um, and it, it is, you know, Crazy Eights does this, you know, they, mm. they, they make a reel. But right? they provide you with, they're a producer, so they're providing you with. And I think it's good to clarify that it's not Film Freeway that's doing this, it's individual entities on Film Freeway. And that's one thing the artist has to be, or submitter, rights owner of the, the, the thing you've created is to be careful about where you're sending it to and that you're vetting those people and sure. that every sure. festival you have to look at, like Josh is saying and look at. And I think speaking to what Tamara is saying, I was thinking about this because we talked about, you'd mentioned this before. And I think because there are festivals like Forum and I've submitted and been presented in places where they did have honorariums, I think it would be great to get together a, a letter, like get signatory festivals and start sending out and saying, hey, Forum does this, we pay our, 
and and other people and even to just be able to say here's how we do it here's how they do it some people okay if you're going to have fees maybe offer an honorarium to the people that that are going to get it so i'm not paying a hundred dollars to get in and then you're selling tickets and i get nothing once i'm even in i think that would be really good and a good time to do it because things are shifting yeah sort of like the car fact fee schedule um making sure that there's a minimum payment um for whoever is submitting and you know i mean i i look at sort of I, I'm asked on a regular basis about royalty rates um, for whatever the production is post the initial performance. And the, you know, varies from industry to industry or from medium to medium. But you know, I, I think that there's value in two things. One, asking for a royalty, right? Yeah. If there is going to be some kind of, kind of future life. And secondarily, um, if there isn't an available royalty, then um, tight shortening the window in which uh, a producer or an entity might have to monetize the thing so that it's only available for a limited period. So instead of it being that, you know, uh, non-exclusive uh, in perpetuity and all mediums now known or forever created, yada, 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 um, for all, you know, the in perpetuity language. I, I really strongly would love to see a, a movement where we get rid of the words in perpetuity. There's simply no rationale for their things to be in perpetuity anymore. Um, it, these are digital medium that can shift very quickly. Um, they're, they are different from the analog frame and we can start playing with some of those understandings you know um such that okay you're a small festival like form maybe you would get an exclusive um period if you were of a mind to do that and had the wherewithal to turn into a like crazy eights that deliver a set of films for for content for people like netflix or whoever who anyhow um, and then you could say, but it's for three months um, so that there's an opportunity and there's potentially funding, but it isn't forever. And it would revert back to the uh, original artist to then, you know, maybe 10 years from now, we'll be looking at brimming with a different perception and there'll be a whole other opportunity to monetize it in a completely new way or repurpose it in new technology, right? Um, uh, you know, I think, who is it? Um, uh, Dance for a Small Stage was doing the motion captures and playing around with the techn technological possibilities of, um, of VR and all these things that could really create a whole other platform for dance to be experienced, right? Any thoughts on? I think that already happens now to a degree. So I've licensed music that was for festival use only. Um, so it wasn't in perpetuity. I will say though, it's kind of like the, the union, the union rates thing we were talking about that if you get into a situation where if I'm making a short film, I'm not able to, I will pay dancers to be in the film. And it's specifically that for that film, the rights are in perpetuity throughout the known universe. Like that's a pretty standard thing like you would do with actors or anyone else. And the same with music. And if the musician, or any, anyone involved wanted to say, well, I'll let give you the rights to this for only six months or two years. I would say, well, I'm not gonna put you in the movie. I need a buyout because I don't wanna be in a situation where five years from now, I can't use this film. It's, it's maybe possible to replace music. I've done replacing music. Like I had something for festival use and then I had to replace it because I can't screen it anywhere else or if I wanna try to make money from it. So I think that's a tough one because you wouldn't want to have to as a filmmaker or even 
to have to track down all your actors in 10 years and say, would you let me do this? And if one of them says no, then that film's dead. Like you've bricked, you've bricked the film. It's, yeah. I guess you could spend a lot of money and digitally replace that person. Yeah. And I think it's maybe more figuring out partnerships with, it's like when Josh was saying he's made a project, a streaming thing with a, a um, a presenting entity so they're partnering on that project and they're deciding together where it's where it's going to go and how it's going to be used because you want you want people to be able to exploit the thing that you've created it would be like if you were a choreographer and you created a work and you were working with dancers and they're helping you build that work and then they said well we'll let you perform this for five years and then after that, you have to come back and renegotiate with us. Yeah. So. Yeah, I think, but I think what I'm getting at is it's a really important conversation to have. Yes. About actually, and this goes to what, what is the ultimate question that comes up a lot in dance is who owns this? And what exactly do they own? And how do we declare ownership? Is it the choreography? If it is the choreography, what do we have to do in order to fix it in the in copyright language? Mm -hmm. And then and then what is the role of all the collaboration? This is so it's dance, it's also in theater. Um, and you know, we have these very fixed ways of approaching things. And I understand completely. I say to people all the time. I had a project once come to me where there were a hundred um, different people involved in the authorship of the work. And the, the, the person wanted to share with all hundred. And I was like, administratively, that is impossible. Like you're, it, it'll be a never ending issue. And as you said, all it will take will, is one. And you would have to continually you would have to change it. Now, if it lived as a digital image series of images, say, that might be doable. But in the end, what happened is she created um, by words only, not a legal document. She just said she was she held the copyright in trust mm. for all of these people. And then they were named. Yeah. And that, and, and all she could really offer in terms of an agreement with the, with the, with the co-authors was her, her best efforts to acknowledge them in the event of monetization uh, down the road. But it was, you know, it, again, it goes to that, you know, some of these ideas about how to do things are old. And we need to actively be asking ourselves, especially now, is this something that I need control over? If so, how? Um, and if you are going to be negotiating, um, like Tamar said, if you are going to negotiate with a festival, um, ask. You're never going to get what you want if you don't ask for it, is sort of what I would say as a lawyer. It's, it's always worth asking. Um, and and, and often, in, at least in the situations that I, I've seen in this town, uh, you know, in the last year, a lot of it is everybody wants to do the right thing. Yeah. So, you know, it's yeah. like there was some wonky language in a contract I saw in the early days, and it was like, seemed like they might claim to own the stream. This is a presenter. And I was like, no. And they were like, oh, no, we don't want that. We just want to have it for the archive if there is gonna be an archive of these streams and that's fine. So let's put clear language in your contract that says that um, rather than this wonky kind of language that nobody really understands, which you know, is of course the bane of every, everybody's existence, right? And I suspect now, you know, going back to the theme of this conversation being the pivot to digital is that there's it's very likely at this point now that no one's going to really go back to doing a basic like back of house uh, documentation of their stage show there's going to be these hybrid things that start to pop up where you have of course it's a stage work you make it for the stage for a live audience but 
are you really going to now, after having done all this uh, experience with camera work, go back to just like this terrible from the back of house shot? No, you're going to use the opportunity to try and create some sort of archive of the work that captures the essence of it in a much greater way, knowing the capabilities of film and video. Therefore, this old standard of a dancer is contracted to do a show and, the, and, and then we're going to set up a camera in the back, but don't worry about it. Um, that, that thing is probably going to be gone now, that, that whole kind of dismissal of the video footage that's taken of these performances, because now there's going to be some actual production value in, embedded in those things. And now the performer is also, they're performing on stage for that live audience, but they're also being part of this document that could have a life of its own, that could have its own audience, that could reach to these places that normally we might tour to, which now we might not ever tour to, because these right. things will go out instead. Um, or they'll live online in a way that is infinitely watchable and shareable. So yeah, that whole, the, the basic dance agreement that we that we typically would have, usually just says a little check mark of like, and there's gonna be archival footage, but that we have to now talk about what does archival footage mean? And, yeah. and, and what, is, what is gonna be the long lasting effect of that archival footage on the, the livelihood of the performer who was involved. Right. And who's going to control the archival recordings, right? Because I think what what we are also seeing is, um, and this is something again that we'll we'll be talking about um, next month in the music one is this whole question of creating specific platforms by musicians or musicians to actually control these recordings as learning tools, as other ways of um other opportunities for the artists to get their work out and it seems to me um infinitely applicable to dance as well that you know especially with with the capability of the trans of the digital transformation i mean i've seen dance from companies i would never get a chance to see um and some of it has been just jaw dropping um, some of it has been awful, uh, which is okay too, I think, um, part of, par for the course, but some of it is just like, you know, companies in Africa, just, you know, the one show I saw, I think it was a dance house actually, just blew my mind. It's like, oh my God. Um, and there's a whole world out there we don't see. And it's a way for us, I think, in the moment that we're living in equity, with equity, well, EDI or whatever, the reckoning, however we want to frame it, it's like about time we recognize that these are art forms belong to a whole load of people who we don't see on our stages all too very often either. Um, and any excuse to say, oh, well, you know, forever balanchine it's like please can we not do that but that's just my pet peeve um so i'm curious um we're gonna open up for questions in a few minutes but this this thorny issue of music um what has been your experience uh josh around clearing the music and because it used to be you know you'd go to a show, uh, where would I go to the show? At the dance center. And they have a SOCAN license and everything's taken care of, basically. So what does it mean to, for you now? Well, in the context of a, a making a dance film that you're hoping to share, I think it, now, now this whole idea of how it's going to be shared is, of course, a big factor because it's clearing the rights for any sort of music. Um, it might be easy if you are, it's been easy working with a composer who is making you something and you can have that conversation as it's being made for the thing. You talk about, here's where I want it to live. Here's what I want to do with it. What does that cost? And then it gets made. It's the, it's the, the pre-recorded stuff that is already existing in the world that you want to then capture and put into what you're doing that I find to be um, the most time consuming of the processes where you have to track down the publisher, you have to track down, uh, the, then they have to track down the artist and to get these sort of things cleared. But then you have to answer this huge list of questions around um, who's gonna, how many people are gonna see it, under what context, for how long, 
um, what portion of the work as a whole does this uh, song make up? Um, I've had to, at some point, actually um, write out, you know, what what is going to be happening on the screen during this moment of the music so that there's some context for the artists to agree to it or not, because obviously they don't want to put their work, uh, their sound in a product placement that they're not aware of. They want to they wanna know, you know, what is the context in which my sound is going to be heard. Um, so it, it's, it's come down um, for us uh, if if we are the one who's owning this um, this work that we make this film work, whether it's um, live stream or or a film or any sort of video that's going to live on, we've had to track down this all this stuff and have these negotiations. Each one very separate. Each one not having a very um, specific uh, format for how that negotiation takes place. Um, but yeah, in the end, it's. Um, it seems like it's a huge deal because we've like, for instance, we had one where we were, we were actually going to um, clear the rights for a Radiohead song for a, a film that we wanted to make. And they were actually very cool about it. They were, you know, a small dance company. They were super cool, but they said, but it can't live online. You can only do festivals. So then basically it was like, we had to make the call. Is this a film that we'll never put online? Or is this a film that after it's done its festival circuit, we want it to live online and we don't want to have to swap out the music after the fact. So it came down to it and we said, thanks Radiohead, but we got a pass. And we ended up having someone else just make something. Um, but yeah, so it's, it's really tough to decide, um, you know, what's your limit? I guess I probably could have said, if we paid you this much money, would you let us do it online? But I don't think um, for that particular artist, it would have mattered. They just don't want their stuff living in a context that they can't control. Exactly. Yeah. And that's really common. Um, it depends on the, the artist, of course, but it's that's not an uncommon scenario at all. Um, what about you, Alison, in the work that you've done? Have you had to switch things out? Yeah, I've done, I've, I have to do all the stuff Josh is talking about. Every time you have someone working on a film, you have to contract and make sure that if it's something that they already have, a pre-existing piece, you're licensing that music, that they actually own all the rights for it. And you want to have cue sheets for everything so they will get compensated if it's aired anywhere and you want to register all of those. So even with if we're hiring, and generally if I'm hiring a composer to create music, it's a work for hire, hire situation where we would potentially co-own what they create or in if I was paying them real money, the entity I was, my company would own it. But because I'm so low budget, I usually just say, let's pretend you made it and I'm licensing it. So they're creating work for me, but then I treat it like a license as opposed to a work for hire. But you still want cue sheets for all of that stuff. And I think that I, I have had a situation where I, I got a song that was perfect for a, a feature documentary I'd made and it was licensed and it was for festival use only. And I decided to go for that because it was perfect, but I had knowing I would have to change it out. And it took a long time. The composer who'd done everything else couldn't find anything quite right for that that fit. But while it was doing the festival run, she came up with something, we made something and so yeah it's but it is it is quite a bit of work and again though it's necessary work because that's another artist who's making their living doing that and they're supporting your work and you have to make sure they're compensated just as every other contributor is yeah and what about for you tomorrow yeah the biggest thing and i think this is in general with film is that time is a is, is a big thing and big part of it and time consuming. And, and so it feels almost backwards, but you have to predict things and plan ahead. And with music, especially when I'm creating something, I have to almost pretend like I already know that I'm going to get into festivals and I'm already going to have it screening at certain places. So I either get someone to make music for me and come to an agreement before the film is even made. So it's taken care of and we have agreement around if I get paid for a screening, how do we separate the payment and all of that? Or if it is that you're going to license a piece of music, start way ahead of time because this is something.
something I see as a festival organizer happen quite often where people submit films and in the terms and conditions, it says like you have to own the rights to the music. And a lot of people, they don't read it. They don't read it. And then a month before the festival, they're like, wait, I don't actually own the rights to the music. And then you have one month to like scramble and <laughs> try to like get the rights. So I think like from learning from experience and from seeing what happens to other people is you have to, you have to work backwards and yeah. you have to think of things that you wouldn't usually think of when you're necessarily creating just the dance for the stage, like steps, many steps. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, if there's a more part of the reason why I was so, um, I jumped on Josh's story on Facebook was simply that um, knowing this this landscape and knowing how film works, this is exactly the these are the exact issues that we were would be predictable, and people were not prepared for that, and they're still not, and there's um, and and so we need to part of the purpose of this discussion and and the the materials we're going to create over the summer is to give some support to um, the dance community all artistic communities, some sample contracts, some ex explana explanatory other, other stuff, whatever we can think of, so that people understand what, they, what these words mean. What's a cue sheet? What's a, what is clearance? What is, you know, how do I get clearance from a publisher? Who do I call? All of those things that for most artists, unless you're in music or in film already, that is not going to be obvious. And there are things that people need to know and should be thinking of and, and presenters as well. Um, because those are the questions and those are the questions, especially dance with so many artists working individually, like, or in very small groups. And I, you know, just the, the quantity of work that is created and sort of like TikTok is, you know, not, not to, to diminish your work as contemporary uh, dancers at all, um, and the incredible technical skills you have. Um, it just demonstrates, TikTok kind of demonstrates though, the, the importance of the, and the value of the genre at some level. I don't know. It's like, everybody wants to dance, right? So like, let's figure out a way to value, um, the, the making of the making of dance in the way that it's meant to be. Um, so there was a question. Did you want to say something, Josh? Yeah, I, I wish I, I wish I had the skill set for a TikTok account so I could. <laughs> I want to be the TikTok lawyer. TikTok lawyer. Ooh. I, I haven't figured out how to do that, but I said that to Angela. Oh, you could just do little, you could even do it. Maybe this could be your project for this specifically. It could be TikTok law for dancers. TikTok law. Niche. And then just say, here's your con, like go through, like there's so much that we've talked about. It would be great to have a basic contract between presenters for streamers. Make sure you touch on this, this, and this. The top, oh, God. top 10 tips. Marcus, yeah, you could be here. doing a, a TikTok series. I think that would be a great idea. You're laughing, but I'm dead serious. <laughs> it would go viral. It would definitely. And it would be I so know. useful, especially all of this stuff for the dance community in terms of negotiating your contracts with this new exhibition format. And then in terms of with presenters, how you can share things. Yeah, yeah absolutely. It's super well, helpful. I'm, you know, hopefully I'll, we have a young team and with this, we're our, our staff lawyer starts uh, next week or two weeks from now, yay. Um, so we'll finally have some capacity for maybe that to happen, I don't know. Um, so we got a couple of questions when we um, people were registering. And one that I think is, I, I think is really important to answer, not by me, is um, if the work wasn't created for a digital platform, should you rework it in studio with the videographer, editor, so that it can then be enhanced in the digital medium? Um, do you have an answer, um, Josh or Tamar, Allison? I have a first comment. Yes. Someone owns the footage. It's like stock footage. Someone owns that. Who owns that? 
That's what, what needs to be decided when it's shot. Who owns this footage? <laughs> What's the agreement? Even if it's, we both own it. And, and then what are we gonna do? Even if it's just a basic letter of agreement saying this footage belongs to you, um, you have, but I have uses to, to use it for non-commercial purposes, you wanna decide right away. So as soon as you you're making footage, who owns it, what the purposes are, and that everyone's okay with that. Then the next question. <laughs> well, I think the next question, it's, it's an artistic question. It's, it's really about what, uh, well, I mean, if I was to answer the question for me, it, it would be, um, do I think that the essence of the work or the, the thing that was driving the intention of the work will be visible uh, or will be prominent in a way um, without me changing it. And more often than not, I would imagine I wouldn't feel like it would be offering the same thing with my type of work, the type of work that, I, um, that I'm shooting after. In a live context, I'm working with a different sense of transmission and I'm thinking of a different sense of like reception of that uh, and how I imagine sharing space with a viewer is completely different than um, the way that it's framed through a, a flat screen if it has to be transferred through a digital means that way. So I do think I would change it. I, I, I think that um, there would be a way for me as a creative problem solving um, exercise to try and figure out okay, well, if I have to lose all these things that are shaping the work in this real space, how do I recreate those things in this flat space? Or how do I, um, what more can I give the viewer through this other lens or through these additional capabilities that video might offer? So in that sense, I would say, yes, I, it, there, something has to change in order to, for the most important parts to remain. But I will say that some things I don't think are meant to uh, live in both of those worlds. And I think there's there's many, there, through the pandemic, we've had this grieving process of uh, stuff where we're like, okay, this, this thing only existed in my mind where there was gonna be somebody right in front of me. And that was gonna be how it worked. And I'm not gonna try and change that into something it's not. And I don't think it's possible what I, my dreams for it would not be possible and through this other way. And that's what I've just decided. I might be wrong, but it's what I've decided. And so it's just, a, it's an artistic choice, that idea of changing. Yeah. What about for you, Tamar? Yeah, uh, similarly to Josh, um, something that I've heard since the pandemic started, and I completely agree with this is that you feel something different when you watch dance live, when you go into a theater and you sit and watch. It's a very different experience than watching a documentation, one shot, or maybe you got <laughs> two angles of, of the piece. It's a very different feeling. And so I know a lot of dancers and choreographers are like, well, it's not, it's not sending the message or it's not giving the effect that I wanted to give. And so if you are questioning should I move this to a digital platform? I think the first thing you should ask yourself is how can I create it for that platform rather than try to take something that was meant for the stage and just kind of force it into a film setting. And so if that is something that intrigues you and that is something that you're curious to see if it can be made for a different kind of output, then I say go for it. And I think especially if you're interested in collaboration, there's a lot of filmmakers that can show you how to do that. Like you can have an idea and you can explain to them what you were hoping to transmit with the choreography and, and filmmakers who have been doing this for so long can show you how they might do that. And it can become a conversation rather than just like, I am the choreographer and this is what I do. And then there's like the videographer who's gonna video it for you and so i think it's it's about willingness to to learn something new and see a different point of view and then also acknowledge that like nope this isn't working <laughs> and like Josh said like i this is not how i want to share the work and that's totally okay too like i think the pandemic just made us all miss watching dance so much and we wanted to share stuff but some things can wait 
and I think we're almost there. So it's like, it's worth it. Yay. <laughs> Yay. Yeah. Well, I, go on, Alison. Oh, sorry. I just wanted to sort of address the original question in terms of who owns and can use the digital content after filming. That's something that needs to be decided between all the people that are involved, because you may be fine. Like I, I'm in, maybe Josh has choreographed something and I'm in it and you've shot it and you said, I'm never going to do anything with this other than have it for archival purposes. And I was like, well, could I use me? Could I, would you be okay for me to use the footage of me for something? And could I use the footage of me and make a whole other film or do something with it? Would you, like, that's potentially a conversation of, around this footage that, that you guys have all decided who owns it and how they're going to use it. And then um, if the dancer was paid for the film shoot, does it then become the producer of the film's property and can it be used at their discretion? Generally, yes, but that again is based on the agreement that you sign related to that film piece in your participation. And I think um, in, the, in the realm of at least, you know, in my experience here in this town, um, people like you and certainly Evan Stevens, you know, th they will, you know, I don't know what your practice is, Allison, but with, with Evan, it's, here's the footage. I make the film, the film is mine, and some of, and the raw footage of you, you can use. Um, it's because it, there's so few ways to acknowledge the contribution of the dancer to the, to the, to the work. Um, because, you know, you're not treated in the way that actors are treated as members of the Screen Actors Guild or actor or whatever. And so it's re I think it's really important and for her. Um, this was part of our conversation, which we did at Forum two years ago, was precisely around the ethical um, impulse that she felt it was extremely important to give something back to the dancers so that they were able to then, who knows, it may, may, most are probably not going to do anything with it, with it. On the other hand, somebody might. And, you know, it's, it's why, and why not? Yeah. Um, and what that is also an, an issue that's coming up. Um, and as uh, recently, um, I heard a talk uh, by um, the filmmaker, um, uh, who made the film The Angry Anuk, Alethea, um, I can't remember her, the rest of her name, my apologies. Um, and she spoke about the rematriation of um, the footage that was included in The Inconvenient, Inconvenient Indian, um, which was one of the films directed by Michelle Latimer, uh, and, uh, and that it should be rematriated. Um, to the indigenous communities uh, that it was where it was shot. Uh, and that, that very issue, the rematriation of imagery is central to the work, current work of Nettie Wilde with, her, with all of the raw footage from her many documentaries, uh, including in Chiapas, um, where that film stock is that film, those reels and reels and reels the trunks full of film are now living in Mexico at the, Univers uh, the Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México. And, um, and they're working on both archiving it as well as making the footage available to Mexican filmmakers to, uh, to do something with if they are of a view to, because the perspective of many people uh, of that historical moment is not simply Nettie's. And I think that again raises those very issues for dance as well, which is, you know, there's there's a multiplicity of peoples and, and creativities in the work. Um, and yeah, so so glad you brought that up, Allison, because um, we had a whole conversation about that uh, last year. We'll just take this last question from, from Janice. Um, with regards to contracts, could it be possible to combine an artist agreement for the production presentation and then a use fee structure for the screening if it is intended for a hybrid presentation, future use, and TikTok? 
I mean, I think that's, if I understand correctly, Janice, I think that's what basically people are doing is they're taking their existing uh, analog presentation or stage presentation contract and they're adding provisions in that address uh, what happens when the, when the work is live, live streamed or when the work is recorded and then the recording is going to be um, uh, used again or shown subsequently. Um, so Tara Cheyenne just did a work actually, Body Parts, which was filmed and then, um, and then offered as the film with a, with a talk back, which I sadly missed, but I hope to see again, um, Tara, so please do it again, um, if you're still out there. Uh, but I think, I think she is doing it again. She mentioned oh, that she had one coming up. Yes, we need it in schools, Tara. That 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 show it needs to be in every high, every high school in this in the world. How about that? Just global, yeah. global. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think I think that's the answer to your question, Janice. Is yes, I think that's how to do it. Uh, I don't know if Allison or Josh or Tamar have any thoughts on that. I mean, I think that I think that makes sense. It's then it would be on the the owner of the work. I don't know. So let's say, for instance, um, if it was the presenter uh, paying a presentation fee to the company, and then addition, um, you know, hundred bucks per um, showing afterwards, or I guess like online screening of that show afterwards, then it would be on company 605 to inform all the people who were involved that there would be more than just this performance of their work. Um, there would be these residual performances. And so then that, that would uh, require that the company does a lot more work, I think, to then um, build the contracts for the people who are involved in the actual presentation of it, uh, either something similar or a buyout or some other way of capturing this, what might be a, a forever situation of possible performances in the future. Yeah. Well, yeah. And you could you could potentially uh, uh, offer an option um, of a buyout fee for buyout for throughout the new universe in perpetuity, or you could say, these are the specific uses it's for. If anything else comes up, we'll, this is what the price would be or, or that we'll split residuals for a thing. Because I think it becomes, a night, it becomes a nightmare for the person collecting the fees potentially to track if it's, if it's little bits of things. But if it's a small number of people, it would be easy if you have a small team and it's maybe only a few dancers, it could be easy to say, we'll just split like it's, throughout the known universe, but every time we screen somewhere, we'll split the revenues this way. It's 25% each or whatever. Like I have agreements like that with, cause I made a feature film and people worked on it for literally years. And so there was, it was a no money thing, but we had um, deferrals. So the key people, I'm making $25,000, it's deferred. And the contract said basically when the expenses of the film are paid off, those people are getting paid in like proportion, what you will know the legal term para presui or whatever the term is, first tier, because there's other people that would get money after those main people were paid out. You can structure stuff like that. Like Yeah, I mean, and also. then you, it, that really does bring us sort of full circle back to this idea of um, the artist has to be the business person or the, you know, you got to run it like a, a business. And, I'm, and I mean, this is one of the, one of the difficulties that exists, um, which is that uh, at the end of the day, you need, you need contracts that you understand and that you can explain to someone else. You do not need boilerplate legalese. You need to. You need language that you can understand and explain to someone else. And um, and so even if I might say, you know, I've seen contract X and it isn't perfect, but it does explain what it needs to explain, and it does state it clearly enough that both parties will understand it. I'm not going to overthink it. I'm not going to replace that contract just because I want to add something. 
um, the contract that we, we, the template that we've developed um, that we're gonna make available in the next few weeks is one that actually was used for a film production, uh, a, doc a documentary, um, and we'll talk about it on the music one, but where it, it actually starts with everything that every artist wants on page one, and that all of the legal language is in the behind is in the next four pages. And we tweaked it to make it a little simpler, but it it's a relatively simple agreement. Now, the license provision is a, 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 a ironclad, um, but that's because people like me want these things to be ironclad. Um, so who knows? Yeah, but you know, I mean that's that is actually. I'm going to bring it to a close with the, with the fact that, you know, come September, uh, those of you in the in the arts, those of you here today who are in BC, UConn, will have access to an actual legal clinic with a staff lawyer, and you can make an appointment to speak to a lawyer. And one of the jobs that that lawyer will have, it will go to beyond the summary legal advice to, you know, helping with negotiation, if that's what it means, uh, actually drafting for artists. I mean, the whole point of the exercise here is that we're on, on the cusp of a national network of legal clinics for the arts where, where some of this stuff we will hopefully demystify so that you'll know at least when you, which parts of the contract you absolutely need to read. And for the ones that you sort of look at and go, huh, maybe you'll know enough that you won't worry about them. They won't. You won't need to wake up in the middle of the night uh, with uh, fear in your in your belly, you know. But uh, I can't guarantee that. But um, <laughs> you know, my experience, most artists don't want to look at any of it at all. So, but it would be super helpful even to just have little templates that are between the artist's company and the presenter, and between the presenter, like the the performers, anyone involved with that, because that could be a very basic thing that just outlines and explains, here's what we're using this for, and here's what you're getting paid, and here's what it covers, and people can go yes or no. And then if individual artists have questions in terms of can I use this footage or anything else like that, can easily just get added in, because it's often just a matter of formalizing what you're verbally agreeing to. Yeah. Agreed. And that everyone's clear and it's like, okay, great. Yeah. And, and I should point out um, that email exchanges are legally uh, binding contracts. Um, using the word confirm is really important. I'm confirming that you're only going to share, put this up on your site and not anywhere else. Something like that. Okay. It isn't perfect, but it's something. Um, you know, and if you ever watch, shows like Judge Judy, then you know that text messages are also, uh, that that can create a contract. So we don't need to turn this into something that is really hard. Um, yeah. maybe, maybe, maybe over the course of the summer and fall, we'll do a series of TikToks, I don't know. Um, Sheldon's on the call, he, he's, he's our chief law student this summer and if he and I can figure out how to do it, you never know. But yeah, you know, I'm all for making this as simple as possible. Thank you to each of you for making time today to talk about these issues. I know from experience that the expertise is in you, not with me. Um, you've been there, done that, got the t-shirt. And I am so grateful for, to you, Josh, Allison, and Tamar for making time. And you have been paid, you will be paid for everybody's benefit. <laughs> uh, and most importantly, God, I look forward to seeing all of your work and to seeing you back in the theater soon. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, from, from these lips to uh, someone's ears, uh, maybe it's uh, Bonnie Henry's, I don't know. Um, a uh, merci à tous, to no, uh, uh, Tout le monde de Québec ou uh, de la monde francophone um, et au revoir. À la prochaine. So goodbye, everybody. We'll see you next time.